We will welcome to the show this morning, though, from Radio New Zealand, Guy and Espinite. Guy, and good morning, and welcome to the show, sir. Kia ora, thanks for having me. Kia ora, very good to be with you, of course. We've got you on to report about the biggest news story of the day, which is the Will Smith incident. No, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. That's going to be the second half oh, of the quite show. I'm quite happy to give up. Yeah, yeah, well, go for it. <laughs> Guy and Espinite on Will Smith assaulting Chris Rock. Go, sir. Well, I'll probably get myself in trouble for this, but I did have a certain amount of sympathy for him, you know. I mean, you know, we've all been there, haven't we? You know, someone assaults someone you love and you sort of, you know, get passionate about it. I can definitely relate to the passion. I've got a certain certain degree of sympathy for him, you know, and it was an open hand, you know. It wasn't the end of the world. (laughs) Um, all right, Guy, uh, the actual reason we've got you on, obviously, is to talk about this uh, article report that you guys at RNZ have put out titled Licence to Kill, the startling truth about New Zealand's uh, fatal police shootings. Um, why don't we just start by giving you the floor somewhat, sir, and uh, giving us a heads up as to what it's all about, why you've written about it, and uh, what it tells us. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Look, I got really interested in this subject when I started to investigate a particular uh, police shooting um, of Shagan Stevens um, some five or six years ago in Rotorua and started to look at what happens when police kill. You know, it's a homicide. They then have to investigate. And in our system, they're the only ones who investigate. So they investigate themselves. And how mm. robust are, they, uh, are those investigations and, and, and what actually happens? And so we thought we'd take a really big and depth look at this. And so you've got to start with what's the magnitude of the problem. I mean, how often do police fatally kill someone? Um, and we found out quite a lot compared to other countries we might compare ourselves with. About 11 times per capita than, than England and Wales. So roughly 40 people shot dead since 1990. Um, and it's a lot more than Australia or Finland or Japan or England, Wales. Um, America's out there on its own, um, as you can probably imagine. But per capita-wise, we, we, we do have a lot of fatal shootings. And then you're looking at, well, what were these circumstances? A lot of people think, oh, they're, they're armed gang members. And, and look, you know, if someone's got a gun and they're shooting at you, you know, I don't think there's, there's any debate. But a lot of these cases, it's not the case. Um, a lot of these guys had hammers, um, you know, bats, and were smashing up windows, and you get shot for that in New Zealand. Um, obviously, disproportionately Māori, that's that's off, often the case. Um, but also, a lot of these people didn't have guns at all. So we looked at that, um, looked at what the circumstances were of these of these shootings and how often it happens. And, and then we also looked at... Um, you know, how often, um, you know, how these things are actually investigated when the police actually go and do investigate them, uh, these, these uh, themselves, how, how robust are they, what what happens, how, how do they actually manage these conflicts of interest? So I guess that's how we got started on. I was, one of the things I was looking at is the IPCA and how they investigate. So basically what we're saying is the police investigate the police. Uh, the, the data and stuff that we're looking at now start 1990. I looked at some of the information pre-1990 and 39 deaths by police since 1990, but I think it's only 47 in total since 1941. So between for the previous 50 years, there was only an additional eight citizens killed by uh, New Zealand police. What's changed? What's changed since 1990 to see this hockey stick up of people being killed by police compared to the previous 50 years. And i got to say the previous 50 years also before the IPCA, which makes me think how were things investigated prior to 1990? Yeah. So there's sort of two angles there. Why the yeah, hockey stick and why and was both, it, how was it investigated? Yeah. And both good angles. Um, I hadn't actually looked into the pre-1991. So it's, it's, it's a new point you're raising with me. And I, I did look um, pretty closely into this. A couple of things come to mind. Um, you know, there are vastly more police um, nowadays. Um, you know, every uh, political party, especially if they're in coalition with Winston Peters, um, but just about every sort of, um, you know, bargaining election, um, the promises to increase the numbers of police, and this goes down incredibly well. 14,000 staff in, um, in the police now. Not not quite that many police, but but not far shy of it. Um, so that, that, that that's vastly increased. The also thing is access to police for firearms. So we say that we're an unarmed police force. Well, we are in the sense that we don't carry the guns on the hips, and so it's not visible to you. But in every police car, there 
there are two Bushmaster M4 semi-automatic rifles that are, you know, serious killing machines and Glock pistols. So there are four of those guns in every police car. So, you know, a lot of these cases that I looked at, you know, the, the, a cop can um, come back to the car and, and, and grab the gun or arm up as they are going out to a job. Um, which never would have been the case um, in, the, in those early years. So the access to firearms is, 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 is obviously a big one. You could overlay a whole bunch of social problems um, to that. I mean, let's be honest, meth has been an impact. Yeah. And drugs and alcohol, and I count alcohol in that, are a big impact. And, you you know, you can see a, a bunch of social problems overlaid over that. But I think um, sheer numbers of police and access to firearms is a, is a, is a, big, um, is a big one. Just before I throw to either George or Chewy, um, just so you know, actually, the reason I got to 41 was from some RNZ reporting as well. So this was a, an article from uh, 2015 that oh, listed yeah. the number of shootings since 1941 as 65. And then I just used your numbers and added in nice. the ones beyond it. And that's how I got to um, whatever it was, 47. Nice. Um, so so that's the, that just so people know that's the, the way yeah. I worked it out. And does raise a question about only eight people in 50 years versus like yeah. saying 40 people in 30 years. You know, what does the data say about us compared to the rest of the world for 80 years versus the 30 years and why the hockey stick? I'm interested in those delving into those at some stage as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, guys, uh, jump in? Guy on, um, when you were looking at the IPCA reporting that, so I'm, I'm just looking at a quote here, the chair, Colin Doherty, said that they were justified on the basis that these shootings were justified on the basis of self-defense. But, and this is important, said in multiple cases, the police put themselves in a position where firearms were the only option. What, how, how, what, what's your sort of um, assessment of how the uh, independent police conduct authority is uh, basically policing the police? And is there a problem maybe with language and categories going on there? Yeah, another good question. And we've got a big report out tomorrow, which looks solely at the IPCA. So, so keep a keep an eye out for that. But, um, yeah, th th that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's called it's the f in the final frame, right? And and some and the Americans call it, um, you know, officer created jeopardy. So it, if I rush right up to you, um, and then we have a confrontation, and then I shoot you, and I say, look, I thought he was going to kill me. Um, then under Section 48 of the Crimes Act, that's a legally justified shooting because anyone is legally uh, allowed to use as much self-defence as, as the circumstances warranted. And you'll find that the police have never prosecuted one of their own. And in every one of these cases, the IPCA says the shooting was legally justified. But then if you look at the full frame of it, why why did the situation happen? And, and we went and talked initially about why I first became interested in this was a shooting of Shargan Stevens, who... In the 38 days before the incident, right, he, he's a guy who he, he got, he flipped out and he smashed up a cop car with a weed slasher. No one in the cop car at the time, he smashed all the windows. He, he got shot. Now, in the 38 days leading up to that, they bail checked him 70 times, including at 3.15 in the morning, 1.49 in the morning, 2.15 in the morning, twice a day, kept, kept waking him up. Now, uh, that, that's, a, that's, that's one example where you know, there's a certain amount of provocation there. Um, and the opposite um, strategy in, in, in an incident, obviously, is cordon and contain. I'm a, not an expert. I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an armchair warrior in this respect. I haven't gone out there and done this, what the cops have done. So, look, mm -hmm. hats off to them. This is dangerous, hard stuff. But in police forces where they have fewer of these shootings, often that's the approach that they use, a, a cordon and contain and a de-escalation um, sense. So, but, yeah, to get more pinpointed in, in the answer to that, I think that the, the, the IPCA powers of a week. They they aren't able. They don't have the power to prosecute. They can only make recommendations to the police. Um, other bodies overseas, people might have seen um, in the line of or line of duty, uh, the British uh, um, drama series, where they go really hard on the cops. AC12, the Anti Corruption Unit. Other countries have um, police monitoring bodies that can seriously get in there and um, robustly and aggressively investigate and prosecute the police. We don't have that, and it's so it's left to the police to prosecute themselves. And I I think you know it'd be a rocket scientist to work out that that creates a certain conflict of interest and a perception that they go easy on their own. Hey, Guyan, 
from a, from the investigating of this from your side, I guess you're investigating the investigating, aren't you? Because it's looking at the <laughs> IP. Yeah. Do you, have you got any personal opinions or any conclusions you've drawn for some of these that aren't justified from what you've looked at? Oh, I think it goes back to to um, the the position that they've put themselves in. Um, and I look at, say, the Jerem Toms shooting where the officers fired thinking they were the only ones at the scene, yet there was a dog handler getting his car. There were eight, seven or eight police cars behind them, um, no communication, a helicopter above. You know, So the marshalling of the resources are all there to bring down a guy who did have a machete. That must have been frightening, you know. But y- you had multiple officers at the scene and huge amounts of resources and could you have done something to, to save a guy who again was mentally ill that's the other very sad thing a lot of these people are having episodes look that must be frightening to deal with but is that the way that we want to deal with them um and and so i think you've got a problem if you're only relying on the final frame and saying well was my life potentially in danger well yes it was and so i was justified in using lethal force and i, I think you've got to look at the whole incident rather than the final frame there's a lot of comments that I see about the levels of training and I just kind of want to come off something you said there, the massive increase in police numbers and it's always uh, a political sort of candy to throw around, I guess. Is the big push to get more officers taking a chunk out of the the time that they have to train these officers to be effective in their firearms, both their usage and their deployment? Oh, it's another very good question. I mean, undoubtedly, they are pushing these people through. It's one of the shortage, the shortest uh, training courses in the Western world. I mean, we do 16 weeks. You think mm. about that. I mean, that 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 is a very short time to be into a job like that. I mean, in some countries, you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, they, they take months, I think Denmark, to, to look at the role of police in society, you know. And, okay, you'd get criticised for being woke or something if you did that here. But, you know, you, you, obviously they are. I mean, th- this is a state-sanctioned um, force with amazing coercive powers. So you do is 16 weeks enough, and and then you've got one week of firearms training. Y- mm. You know, I mean that. And so when you look at it, it's about 650 hours. And we look through, and in Germany, it's about 10,000 hours. And we we've laid wow. it all out in one of those pieces. I can't remember all the numbers, but Australia is like three and a half thousand. We we are down there with the lowest states in America. In America, um, there's no mandatory level because it's all, they don't really like regulation terribly much. Um, and so, but roughly it's about 650 hours. It's similar to New Zealand. So, I don't know, ask yourself, I mean, um, 16 weeks and then one week on firearms training. Um, yes, they do have ongoing um, training as they go. Um, but when you talk to experts in this area, they, they say that, um, you know, that that's not nearly enough. And, and, and they say that there's a spiral and a cycle that works with that. Uh, poor firearms training, poor marksmanship, meaning you then shoot for the largest target, which is the centre body mass, which is going to going to pretty much kill you um and so that it sort of feeds on itself um so i think training is something that you 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 can't really can't really ignore in this debate Mm. um i wanted to ask you about what's sort of a a bouncing off the back of the last thing i asked you guy and about the justified versus unjustified i mean i think a lot of people me i put my hand up and go one of the things that feels unjustifiable is being shot in the back but we because that probably means the person's running away and then maybe there's no danger but from your article I'm, I'm interested into how one of these things has been worded you say rnz data analysis of the 35 ipca investigations into police shootings showed 10 of these killed were shot in the back or from behind at least once the first question that i wanted to know was what do you mean or from behind what's the difference with or from behind or in the back and the second question was when they were shot in the back these 10 do we know if they were only shot in the back or like were they shot in the arm and then they turned and ran and were then shot in the back. So like, was it their, their, their only hit or was it a part of being hit two or three times? But also what do you mean or from behind? What does that mean? Well, they may have been, they may have been shot in the, in, 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 in this, in the side or in, in the leg. Um, but we're, but we're m- moving away from the officer. And yes, in some cases, it was both. 
and we talked a little bit about the Jerem Tom's case before. That was a, a situation where he was shot as he was advancing, and he turned and ran, and they fired another eight shots as he ran away, and one of those did hit him in the back, in the lower back, um, and the last shot was fired, I think, at 14 or 15 metres, so he'd run a considerable distance, and then he collapsed and, and, and died. But, yeah, again, that doesn't really feel right to me. You've got a real issue there with self-defence, haven't you? Um, and that was one that really did surprise me, that they... Um, that uh, IPCA said that was justified. And this is another really interesting thing, right? Because under New Zealand law, it's the perception of the officer. If I say, I felt my life was in danger, I believed my life was in danger. And the officer, when I looked at the homicide investigation into that, said that he believed that Tom's was still coming towards him, even though he had turned and he'd run 10, 12, then 14 metres. Now, okay, possibly... In the heat of the moment, he didn't realise and he was just firing. But um, it, it's interesting that there's that hole in the in the homicide law that that it's your perception. W were you acting in your self-defence as you perceived it at the time? Yeah. The test mm -hmm. of a rational test. I mean, to, to, to me, does that make sense? I, to, uh, to, to you and I, if, I, if I said, well, you know, you're a good chunk of a cricket pitch away, moving yeah. away from me, and I still thought you were coming towards me, I'd probably say, mm, nah, that doesn't yeah. stack up to me. But you are able under New Zealand law, as it's interpreted, to say, well, my perception was he was still advancing on me. So, again, I think that's a, that's an issue. So so just for clarity, that or from behind basically means on the back part of their body, but it might be in their in their yeah. leg or their, or their calf muscle or their – just yeah. not literally in the physical between the shoulders. That's right. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's what I want to know. Chewy, George, you got anything else to wrap up? What we've got going here? Yeah, yeah. Um, going. We were we were looking at the sort of secondary articles as well that came from this reporting. Was there more than one IPCA report? And did you have was there much kind of pushback trying to get this released? I know that one of the reports mentions the word secret, so we wanted to sort of clarify that as well. Yeah, well, I suppose this goes to. Um, so we, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, um, we're releasing our um, investigation into the IPCA that focuses on the IPCA itself and how it works and what the powers are, etc. Um, the IPCA, interestingly, is not subject to the Official Information Act. Um, oh, really? We, no, and, wow. and we look at this tomorrow. Um, so there's a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a heads up there, but. Um, yeah, so you can ask for all the information you like, but you won't get it, uh, not officially. Um, luckily, sometimes things fall off backs of trucks, and we got um, a report that, um, you know, had only been sent to the police commissioner, it hadn't been made public. Uh, and I think it has um, some real issues of um, that go to training and, and, and public interest. Um, so, yes, the IPCA will release its reports into, you know, if someone's shot tomorrow, then in about a year's time, you'll see the report from the IPCA and it will be on their website and they'll make it public. But none of the other stuff behind it, like how they justified this, who did what, the full transcripts, the raw bits of this and that get made public. And nor do any other reports they commission or information or emails. Like journalists, we, we, we're in there OIAing the cops and, and others all the time. You know, Ministry of Health, please give me all Ashley Bloomfield's emails that he's sent about <laughs> such and such. You know, there's all that goes on. And you get a whole bunch, you get a whole lot of stuff you don't, that's not interesting. But but you do you do find, sift through the nuggets of stuff of real public interest, which is why we have an Official Information Act. And America has freedom of information laws, and that's how the whole thing works. IPCA is not subject to the uh, official information act so you know i think that's pretty interesting my own view is it, is it should be i think it's farcical that the sis is subject to the oia and and, and um the ipca isn't um so yeah um it's not easy to get information out of them um other than their public reports and, and i think i i think that's a problem well listen guy thanks so much for uh coming in i've got one more question for you before we let you go um it's not about will smith is it it's not, actually, although I, I noticed that Chris Luxon's just talked about Will Smith. Is he, what does he say? He says, oh. meme, meme of Will Smith slapping Chris Rock posted on a, uh, by National on Facebook wasn't appropriate. Oh, you know, wait, how to yeah. turn it into your I, own I, problem. <laughs> breaking news. Chris Luxon oh, says, don't smack people. 
Um, that, yeah, I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> um, so here's where people can find it on the RNZ uh, website, obviously. But I guess just to wrap, and I know it sounds like what you're telling us is there's more to come, but if you had one takeaway to share at the moment from what you've done and what you've looked at from this investigation, what is it? What's the one thing that you're taking away from that's kind of top of mind when you're thinking about what you're looking at and what you're doing? Yeah, a couple of things. IPCA powers are too weak. They have no powers. They don't have the power to prosecute, and they should be more transparent. Far school not to be open to the OAA. The police go too soft on their own, in my view. These homicide investigations aren't, aren't genuine, aren't robust enough. They give the evidence to them in advance. You don't give the kids the answers to the homework the night before. It's That's farcical. Detectives know that, and they should know better. They've stopped it, and again, you know, um, I, I hope par partially that we've, we've played a role in that. Um, so that they would be the the, the things that I, that I would uh, take away, and also that we we shoot too many people too often. If, if Britain can 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 do far less of it, um, mm -hmm. and we model ourselves on them in so many ways, and especially on our police force, if we're going to be pr proud about the fact we've only got you know that we don't have an armed police force, um, let, let's save that for the most dangerous uh, incidents when people have guns, not when people are smashing up stuff in the street um, or are mentally ill. So that'd be my takeaways. Guy and Esper, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure, and uh, we will keep looking and keep delving into uh, the investigative journalism that you guys are doing over there at RNZ. Uh, and thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks very much for the opportunity, guys. Really enjoyed it.